Hello, and welcome to my channel. Vice Rhino here. Yes, that's right. Classic Rhino is back. Temporarily, I'm afraid. I know there are some of you that don't like to look at my big stupid face, and I can't say I blame you. It's big and stupid. But the big stupid face is the norm now, like it or not. The reason I'm back in classic Rhino form is because between the holidays and the major renovations that are happening in my home right now, I need to cut some time out of my production process in order to not miss a video, and these videos are significantly easier to record and edit. This is a response to an episode of Frank Turek's podcast in which he provides 10 plus questions to ask your woke boss. Let's see what these questions are, and more importantly, see if they are actually good faith questions. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you say to your boss who wants you to go to some kind of diversity training? Some kind of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity training. Well, now it's called JEDI. Have you heard of JEDI? Justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Well, the appropriate thing to say would be, yes, boss, before attending the training. And pay attention, there might well be some stuff that you learn that will actually be useful in interacting with people from a diversity of backgrounds while on the job. Worst case scenario, it'll be a boring, badly done presentation that you at least get paid to attend. Also, I legitimately love that they found a way to call it Jedi training, so that is definitely how I'm going to be referring to it from now on, at least in this video. What do you say? Do you just, just go? You just give in? Yes. Going to training is a pretty basic part of every job I've ever had. There's orientation training, WIMIS training, there's workplace hazardous materials information system training for anyone who works with chemicals on the job, safety training, skills updates and or maintenance training. And hell, in some of the restaurants I've worked at, there were wine training sessions where part of it was to drink some wine and try to guess what type it was. The vast majority of these trainings are snooze fests that you just grudgingly go to, sit through, get paid, and then get back to your actual job when you're done. Going to training sessions that you don't want to go to is a part of life. So just suck it up and act like an adult. I mean, Christians and other people of faith, uh, maybe even Muslims, maybe religious Jews, uh, people who have conscience problems with some of the some of the values being pushed on them by their corporations may have to push back a little bit. If the company you work for holds values that are so deeply offensive to you that you feel the need to object to being trained in diversity, equity, and inclusion, then maybe you should reevaluate your values. Or alternatively, you could just go work for a different company. Now, I know Frank would want to call this persecution and say that anyone who gets fired for refusing to do a required training is being discriminated against based on their religion. But in no way is this saying that you must abandon your religion, nor are you being forced to hold certain opinions. At worst, you're being asked to treat people with respect even if you disapprove of something about them. And companies are well within their rights to have a code of conduct that they expect their employees to adhere to while on the job. Like, if you get hired as a porn actor and then refuse to shoot a scene because your religion doesn't allow you to engage in sex before marriage, that's not on the porn company for expecting you to have sex. That's on you for getting a job where a requirement of that job is a violation of your moral beliefs. If an atheist gets a job at the Ark Encounter and then violates their statement of faith that they make you sign, would you say that it's discrimination for them to fire that employee? My guess would be no, even though we fired them because they weren't the right religion, would be much more clearly a form of explicit discrimination than this employee won't attend mandatory training so they were fired. Yet it seems that some of corporate America, and probably most of corporate America, is now trying to force people to live by lies. I'm willing to bet that this is meant to be referring to treating trans people with respect. Like, you know, using their correct pronouns. I really don't understand people who refuse to do that. It is such a basic thing that takes nearly zero effort on your part and just winds up with you treating someone with a bare minimum amount of humanity. You don't even have to think that being trans is a real thing in order to do it. I mean, you'd be wrong, but you're allowed to think wrong things. Just be polite while you're wrong. The only argument I've heard for refusing to use someone's pronouns is basically what Frank just said. I refuse to encourage their delusion by lying in the form of using their preferred pronouns when I am of the opinion that they should be addressed with other pronouns. Okay, great, I guess, but two things here. First, how do you determine what pronouns to use for someone? Like, I'm sure Frank would be fine with using he, him to describe me, but how would he determine that I'm not just a trans man who passes well enough to be assumed to be male? 
If the answer to that question is something that wouldn't be possible in a public interaction between an employee of a company and a member of the general public, like, say, checking the chromosomes or checking what's in my pants or something along those lines, then why would you treat trans people any differently? Now, sure, there are some trans people that don't pass, but there are also cis people with features that are more typical of the opposite sex. Women who look more manly and men who look more womanly. How do you know that with your misgendering, you're not actually using the wrong pronouns for a cis person who, according to your worldview, is living the way God intended? And this is far from a rare scenario. I've worked with the public and have, on multiple occasions, referred to a woman as sir or a man as ma'am, before I eventually learned my lesson and avoided gender terms like that altogether unless I already knew the answer, and I figured that out on my own without any diversity training, and this was also back when I was an asshole who probably would have been closer to Frank's position on the matter than my current position. Second, even if you were miraculously able to tell when someone is trans 100% of the time, if someone is delusional, then it's not your job to determine what treatment plan they should have. That's between them and their healthcare providers. If there is a delusion, it's not your job to decide what to do with it. Though, in the context of employees interacting with either other employees or with the general public as part of their employment, it is, in fact, your job to treat them with respect. So what do you do? Well, I think asking questions is better than making statements. If the goal is to actually learn from the answers, then yes, I 100% agree. Making statements about how you don't believe what they're teaching in their Jedi training will be unhelpful at best. Back in 2011, I was fired from two companies that I was doing corporate training for. I was fired from Cisco and Bank of America because I had written a book called Correct Not Politically Correct How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. I tried looking into the story, but Frank is the only source for it, and he always says that he was fired. I did find one article on the right-wing website National Review where Maggie Gallagher gave an interview in which she described Frank's work as hosting leadership seminars for Fortune 500 companies. If that's the case, then I'd imagine it wasn't so much a firing as a, we're going to send our employees to a leadership seminar that's run by someone with values more in line with our company values thing. After all, if Frank actually was fired for having written a book that had nothing to do with his job and did not impact his job in any way, simply because that book expressed his religious views, then you'd think he would have taken his former employers to court, and we'd be able to hear about all the details from the official court documents rather than just relying on Frank. And even if I agree that he was fired instead of just not re-contracted to do their speaking engagements, the fact that it was never challenged in court suggests that the reason they gave him was not the fact that he wrote a bigoted book, but was actually something that warranted a firing. Or, you know, because the US is all kinds of fucked up when it comes to employment laws, he could have been working at an at-will employment state so they could just fire him at any time for no reason. But even in that case, they're not allowed to fire you for illegal reasons. So if Frank had enough evidence to confidently state that he was fired because of the contents of his book, then he could still take them to court. I mean, he'd probably lose anyways because it's really hard to prove that they fired you for illegal reasons when they aren't required to give you a reason, but it would have at least been worth a shot. So two things are possible here. One, Frank was fired for unrelated reasons but wanted to turn his firing into a culture war issue. Two, Frank wasn't actually employed by those companies, they just contracted him for seminars sometimes, and then they went elsewhere, either for unrelated reasons or because his book made it clear that his values were not in line with what they thought of as company values. And that book came out originally in 2008. It was not part of anything I did for these companies. I never mentioned the book. It wasn't even in the bio that I gave them. And now with his timeline, the book came out two years before he was quote unquote fired. And of course, he never mentioned in any of his promotional materials that he's a successful author. Frank would never do that. And you know, it'd also be super embarrassing if I somehow managed to find Frank listed on a speaker booking website where the first words in his promotional blurb were something along the lines of award-winning author. Okay, to be fair, that is his LinkedIn page as it appears today, and that is a current speaker booking page. Maybe back in 2010, it just wasn't standard practice for people selling themselves as public speakers to advertise that they are also an award-winning author. No, that's obviously ridiculous. Speakers are always using the fact that they are authors for extra clout. You're selling your leadership seminars and you want me to believe that you didn't have award-winning author as part of the sales pitch? Like, 
I just googled leadership speakers, and the first result was the Sweeney Agency's 11 highest rated leadership speakers. Seven of the top 11 have author in some form or another in their brief bio that you get at their list page. The remaining four all have author on the page after clicking the link that takes you to their more detailed bio. And every single one has links at the bottom to all of their books. Do you honestly expect me to believe that in an industry where pretty much everybody is an author and advertises it front and center, Frank stood out as the only speaker who actually is an author that did not include author as part of the sales pitch? Pull the other one! And also, just as a side note, the LinkedIn page basically confirmed my suspicions that he was not an employee at Cisco or Bank of America, like he said, because it shows that he was a speaker at the Austin Group, which he also owns. They list Bank of America as one of their clients, along with a bunch of others. So no, he was not employed by Bank of America or Cisco, he was a speaker that they hired to run the seminars sometimes, and they decided not to rehire him. That is very different from being fired. This framing is more than a bit dishonest on Frank's part. Uh, but someone Googled me and figured out I had written this book, and I was fired that day. In the name of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity. Yes, in the name of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity, someone who refuses to include and tolerate a diversity of people won't be hired as a leadership speaker. This seems fairly self-explanatory. When I was given the opportunity to talk to the head of inclusion, tolerance, and diversity at Cisco, I didn't make a lot of statements. I just asked a bunch of questions. And here are some of the questions that I asked. I didn't ask all of these. Oh, uh, okay. So now I'm starting to see the picture. He was probably brought into a meeting with this person with the goal of them figuring out whether or not Frank's values were in close enough alignment with the company that they could continue to work with him. And Frank used that as an opportunity to shit on gay people through jacking off in the meeting. If you're unfamiliar, no, I did not just accuse Frank of sexual impropriety, that's Jack J.A.Q. just asking questions. And now he's recommending that everyone do the thing that seems to have been what got him fired? Uh, Frank? I think it's a good thing that you no longer give talks on leadership, because recommending a course of action that you claim got you fired as something that everyone should do if they are ever in a similar situation to you is not demonstrating good leadership ability. I would say stick to being an apologist, it's what you're good at, but you're not very good at that either. Asking questions is a good way to see where the company's coming from and trying to get them to justify certain policies that they have without you appearing to be intolerant or um, someone who is coming across as, say, the church lady, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that clearly doesn't work, because if I take you at your word here, these are the questions that got you fired. And the first question I might I might ask is, can I ask some questions uh, to get some clarification on our company policies? You know, go to the HR director or even your boss. If you have a good relationship with your boss, say, hey, I just have some questions. I, I need some clarification. Can we just sit down privately and talk about this? I mean, I guess it's better than making a scene, but this doesn't fit in with your story. According to you, they brought you in for this meeting after someone snitched on you for being an author, and you said that these were the questions that you asked in that meeting. So when they brought you in for your private meeting, you opened with, can we set up a meeting so that I can get some clarification on company policies? I mean, I guess I shouldn't really expect much better from someone who thinks that the gospel accounts are a single cohesive narrative of Jesus' life, but here we are. I notice that our company values tolerance, as I do, but what what does the company mean by tolerance? So is this a subset of question one, or have we lost track of how many questions there are this early in the list? Does Frank have a hard time counting higher than one? Future Rhino. It appears so. The only question that got a number was question one. What is the definition of tolerance? And then wait, see what they say. Uh, what is the definition of inclusion? What is the definition of diversity? What does it mean, practically? Okay, getting definitions straight when in a conversation where small differences in these definitions could be important is a good idea, but the answers will differ depending on, you know, the various answers that could be given in any particular company. So I hope that the follow-up questions in your little list will take this into consideration rather than just assuming your favored definition that will lead to a gotcha question. In fact, I had a friend who was recently at an event Oh yay, it's time for totally true stories that really happened, I swear I'm not making this up. 
time. Where the CEO got up and said, we're all for Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I know nobody would ever do this because they would probably be fired. I have a friend who totally did this thing one time, but I know that nobody would ever do this. Great. You know, Frank, these totally true stories that really happened, I swear I'm not making this up, tend to work better if you don't admit in the middle of them that it's not something that would ever happen. But they'd have a lawsuit if they were fired. Nice recovery there, Frank. Nobody would ever do this because they'd be fired. But you know what? They'd have a lawsuit if they were fired. So you can totally believe that this person I just made up actually did the thing that I just said nobody would ever do because they'd be able to sue if they did it and they got fired. Are you sure that it was your bigotry that got you canned, or was it maybe just because you suck? Because if one employee said, sir, um, does your assistant make the same uh, salary that you make? Uh, well, no. Well, I thought equity meant everybody gets the same thing. Is that not true? No, that is not true. Very few people are actually arguing for equality of outcome. Equity in this sense would be more about treating all customers the same way, with respect and dignity, regardless of race, religion, orientation, gender identity, or anything else. Or like paying people that have the same position with the same experience the same amount of money, regardless of all those same things. When applied societally, it brings us to things like making sure minority students have access to the same quality of education as white students, which they often don't. In fact, to quote Linda Darling Hammond of the Stanford University School of Education, the U.S. educational system is one of the most unequal in the industrialized world in that students routinely receive dramatically different learning opportunities based on their social status. After going over some spending numbers, she goes on to say, poor and minority students are concentrated in the least well-funded schools, most of which are located in central cities or rural areas, and funded at levels substantially below those of neighboring suburban districts. Recent analysis of data prepared for school finance cases in Alabama, New Jersey, New York, Louisiana, and Texas have found that on every tangible measure, from qualified teachers to curriculum offerings, schools serving greater numbers of students of color have significantly fewer resources than schools serving mostly white students students. But, you know, I mean, that's an old book. It's from 2001. Surely we've fixed systemic racism by now. Nope. According to a 2022 Government Accountability Office report, despite the overall student body becoming significantly more diverse over the years, schools remain largely segregated, with the children who belong to minority groups frequently winding up in schools that are critically underfunded, putting them at a significant disadvantage. So in this case, Equity doesn't mean making sure all the students have the same grades on their report cards. It means making sure they all have access to a high-quality education. In fact, justice and equity are opposites, ladies and gentlemen. No, they really aren't. Like, maybe with your warped understanding of equity, but remember how we're supposed to have been asking for definitions and then actually listening to the answer? You are now assuming an incorrect answer and then getting mad that if they agreed with your incorrect answer, it would be unjust. Or at least they're, they're, they, they contradict one another. Because justice means you get what you deserve. Equity means everyone gets the same. Is that the definition of equity that a company is likely to provide? Or justice for that matter? I very much doubt it. You're not even done with the question where you're supposed to be asking for these definitions without failing to assume an answer that will lead you to a future gotcha. And this is after explicitly stating to listen to their answer rather than assume it. How about you take your own advice? And if you're going to be for justice and equity, you've got a contradiction at the same time. So is this a statement that you're supposed to make at this point? Or are we still pretending that we're just asking questions? Also, what does diversity mean? Well, in the social justice sense, it's typically when you are making a point of including people from a variety of cultural, economic, and social backgrounds. And according to the McKinsey and Company management consulting firm, companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above the national median for their industry than those in the bottom quartile. And same goes for gender diversity, but 15% instead of 35. When combined, they're 25% more likely to have higher than median financial returns. So a good CEO will see this data and then conclude that increasing diversity also increases revenue, so they should make an effort to increase diversity. And according to Frank, CEOs deserve more money because they bring more money into the company. Because in reality, the CEO brings more money in, has more responsibility, 
especially if he's the owner of the company, he's taken more risk to bring the company to where it is. He deserves more money. So this is what Frank's ideal CEO would do, is it not? And this actually makes perfect sense. When you include a bunch of people with different backgrounds, cultures, lived experiences, and whatnot, they are going to bring their own perspectives to the table. Having a variety of perspectives to work with will make it easier for a company to market its products or services to the general population, which, and this might come as a shock to you, Frank, is made up of a variety of people with a variety of backgrounds, cultures, lived experiences, and whatnot. Are we looking for diverse talents? Are we looking for diverse preferences? Are we looking for diverse skin colors? Yes. Tell me why. Because these people with diverse talents, preferences, and skin colors will all have different perspectives, and building a company with this in mind will make your company more likely to be successful than being exclusionary. As an example, let's look at Jeremy's Razors, the shaving company started by the founder of The Daily Wire when Harry's Razors pulled their ads. Jeremy's Razors is a company specifically founded on exclusion. Their whole thing is that when you buy from them, you know that your money is not going to some woke company that does appalling things like <gasps> acknowledge the existence of LGBTQ people. Well, according to their own numbers, which were not released in any sort of business financial statement, but rather in a puff piece on the Daily Wire website, they sold 130,000 razors last year. At their subscription price of $2.25 per razor, that amounts to less than $300,000 of revenue. Let's just double that for shits and giggles since they do sell more than just razors. Well, by comparison, Gillette, one of the companies that the Daily Wire regularly complains about because of their woke advertising, reported an $80.2 billion profit in 2022. Now, personally, if I was forced to choose to be CEO of one of these two companies, I'd go for the one that has nearly $100 billion in revenue annually over the one that's less than $1 million annually. Now, obviously, Jeremy's is fairly new, so you can't really expect them to reach the same kind of market dominance as Gillette in such a short time span. But given that the reviews are full of people complaining about how horrible they are to shave with, I doubt they'll manage to penetrate the market much. But before we move on from the subject, I do just have to share with you my favorite positive review for the Razors. The razor slash handle attachment looked cheap out of the box. Dropped the handle once, and now I cannot connect the blades anymore. Only shaved three times with it. Jeremy just slapped their name on the quickest thing they could find during the campaign. The prices are ridiculous, and the product is garbage. Pamela recommends Jeremy's razors. With positive reviews like that, I'm sure they'll beat Gillette any second now. Another question you might ask is, do we all have to have the same political, religious, or moral beliefs to work here? What an idiotic fucking question. Obviously not, unless it's a religious organization like the aforementioned Ark Encounter. Their answer better be no. If the answer is yes, here comes a lawsuit. Yeah, obviously. This followed immediately after you asking about diversity. You very heavily insinuated that wanting diversity was a bad thing. And now you're turning around and acting all offended that a company might only want to hire people with monolithic political, moral, and religious beliefs? Which is actually extra funny given my Ark Encounter example. Clearly Frank understands that this would be a bad thing that is illegal, but you can bet your ass that he would be ranting and raving if an employee successfully sued the Ark Encounter for discriminatory hiring practices. I mean, I, I, we all agree that we ought to treat one another with respect. I don't know that we do all agree, Frank. You send out a lot of tweets with articles and videos attached that encourage people not to give the basic respect of addressing them with their correct pronouns. FUCKING PRONOUNS! You even took the time out of your day on Christmas Day, the day that you celebrate the birth of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to tweet transphobic bullshit. If the Bible is to be believed, Jesus didn't say a single word about trans people. Yet, you are so obsessed with being disrespectful to them that you decided that was an appropriate thing to do on Jesus' birthday. Worse yet, you probably didn't actually send the tweet yourself. Your Twitter account shows all the signs of being run by staff. So, you paid someone to take time out of their day on Christmas Day in order to tweet transphobic shit on your behalf. So this leads me to one question. If the apologists are treating Christmas as though it's nothing special and can be mostly ignored, does that mean that atheists have won the war on Christmas? We all agree we ought to tell the truth. We all agree on that. But are you asking us to all agree on certain sexual practices? No. We're asking you to mind your own goddamn business when it comes to the sexual practices of people who aren't you. And what, by the way, what does that have to do with workplace productivity? 
Because if you're being an asshole to the gay guy you work with because you don't personally like what he does in the privacy of his own bedroom, that will be bad for workplace morale and lower productivity. You don't have to approve of it, you just have to mind your own goddamn business. The Bible speaks much more harshly about adultery than it ever does about homosexuality, but I'm willing to bet that the Christians who just can't leave the LGBTQ people alone because that would conflict with their religion have no problem ignoring the promiscuity that some of their co-workers have engaged in. Just apply that same attitude to LGBTQ people. It's not your business, so don't fucking worry about it. You don't have to like them, but you do have to come to grips with the fact that LGBTQ people exist. Are we supposed to have sex at work? Depends on the job. As I pointed out earlier, for a porn actor, it's usually an expectation. Now that, that might be a little, little too much in your face, but <laughs> actually... If the sex at work is too in your face, then maybe ask if you can do cream pie scenes instead of facials. Or wear glasses. Accommodations can probably be made. But you know, joking aside, honestly, I don't see the relevance of this question. This is supposed to be about asking for clarification on company policies in a way that will encourage the company to change them. How would a question like this accomplish that? At best, you'll get an annoyed glare from your boss with that one. Why is corporate America so obsessed with sex at work? Are we supposed to have sex at work? Why are we talking about this? The fact that you're focusing in so hard on this shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the issue. None of this has anything to do with performing sex acts at work, except for a very few specific industries, that's pretty much always not allowed. The issue is with people like you, Frank, who obsess over sex enough that you feel the need to treat people that have different sexual preferences than yourself as lesser people who don't deserve the same respect as the people who have sexual preferences that you share. And yes, regardless of sexuality, the specifics probably shouldn't be brought up at work. I don't need or want to know if my coworker has a foot fetish, but there are some things that will just come up in general conversation that will reveal some of these sexual preferences if you're the kind of person who dwells on sex more than is probably healthy. Like, if a guy starts talking about his husband, you now know that he is gay, bi, or pan. But if you're a normal person who is not obsessed with sex, you probably don't immediately start thinking about his sex life when he's telling you a story of something mundane like going out for dinner with his husband. But for some reason, when straight cis people talk about their significant others, Frank doesn't seem to immediately make assumptions about their sex lives. It's only when LGBTQ people do it. Which suggests an unhealthy level of obsession that you should probably see your therapist about. He never clarifies it in this podcast episode, but that is what Frank means when he's talking about sex at work, because he references an article on his website called Sex at Work in a bit that I skipped earlier, and in that article he makes it abundantly clear that he's talking about homosexuality. Also, this article provides another account of him being fired, and once again, it contradicts the other versions of the story that I've seen so far. In some versions of the story, it was a student at one of his seminars that found out about his book. In others, it's just an anonymous someone. This time, it's a homosexual manager. And he very heavily insinuated in this video that he was called into the Jedi office, but in that article, it was just a phone call with the chief Jedi officer. Though in some consistency, it does once again leave out the fact that Frank was a speaker that they regularly contracted for specific events, and frames it as though he were a regular company employee who was immediately fired at the request of the person that Frank repeatedly calls the homosexual manager. He can't just call him the manager, he always has to make sure he gets the gay label. And therein lies the issue. Frank does not treat people equally if he thinks they might have sexual preferences that he doesn't like, and we see that in this article. There's no real reason for him to single him out as being gay. Like, sure, it's relevant that a gay man was uncomfortable with Frank's presentations once he learned that Frank was an out-and-out -out bigot who proudly slaps his name on books that are vehemently anti-LGBTQ, but he plays this off as an extra slap in the face. Before he learned that I'm a person who despises him for something he has no control over, even the homosexual manager gave my seminars high ratings. So, see? That's proof that it had nothing to do with my actual job performance. It was all just a disagreement about stuff that isn't relevant. Except even if he enjoyed the seminars before, how can he be expected to get anything from them in the future if the entire time you're on stage, all he can think about is the fact that you regularly write books about how deplorable he is? 
Now, if you were an actual employee for the company, they might have to do things differently, like make sure you're not giving talks to groups that this manager is in, or make some other form of accommodation. But since you're just a guy that they bring in to give talks sometimes, it's a fairly easy choice to just say, oh, this guy now makes one of our valued management team members extremely uncomfortable because he's an open bigot against LGBTQ people? Okay, we'll just go with someone who doesn't do that next time. And none of this has anything to do with talking about or having sex at work. Does the company think it's right to force employees to violate their consciences? What do you think these companies are doing that would force people to violate their consciences as far as Jedi goes? All you need to do is exactly what you've been saying so far in bits that I've been skipping because they get very repetitive. As long as we treat everyone with respect, as long as we agree to tell the truth and not lie and be polite. I mean, the not lie bit is clearly in there as a way of justifying using the wrong pronouns for some people, and that's not even one that is universally applicable. I have worked in restaurants. Do you know how many people I said excellent choice to when they ordered the worst bottle of wine on the menu? Lots. But that's the thing about wine. Not only is taste subjective, but expectation can alter your perception. If you go to a winery and do a tasting, when the person describing the wine tells you that there are notes of cherry and leather with blackberry on the palate and a smooth oaky finish, they have now primed your brain to expect those things, and your brain will actively work to make you notice them. That's actually a description that could be applied to almost any barrel-aged red wine, but having a glass of wine after getting that description will make it a more enjoyable experience. So when someone orders what everyone agrees is the worst bottle on the menu, and no, it's not that it was the cheapest, so it was just servers wanting more tips getting mad at the people who ordered cheap booze, it was legitimately bad wine, you can prime them to expect it to taste good by telling them that it does, and then their brains will actively work to make that a reality. By lying to them, I have now increased the chances that they will have an enjoyable experience, which is what being a good server is all about. Now, could I have said that lying violates my conscience so I won't do it? I'm just going to tell people that it's a shit bottle of wine when they order it? Sure, I could have done that, and then I wouldn't have lasted long. Now, obviously I've made this a bit more black and white than it is in reality. There are plenty of degrees in between where I could just not comment on the quality of their selection, but that's kind of my point. It makes their experience better when the server validates their choices. They are then more likely to actually enjoy their experience, and will be more likely to become a repeat guest, and will likely leave a better tip. So it's win-win-win. The customer has a good time, and the company and the server make more money. So while it would be possible for me to avoid lying, the lie is actually beneficial for everyone involved. But let's pretend it's as black and white as I originally presented it. If I am unwilling to lie and feel that I must comment on the quality of what the customer is ordering, I'm not going to last long at that company. And that's something that I should know going in. I should not be looking for a job in an industry where the job requirements will violate my conscience. To go back to an example I've already used in this video, I would not expect Frank to take a job in a porn production company if they were to offer one to him, because I know that he's anti-porn. So no, the porn company does not have the expectation that you need to violate your conscience in order to work there. They have the expectation that only people who are okay with porn will even apply there. If you think porn is immoral, don't work at a porn company. If you think gambling is immoral, don't work at a casino. And if you think LGBTQ people existing and being treated with the same respect you treat anyone else with, including things like using the correct pronouns and not acting all offended when they mention going on a date with their partner or spouse, is immoral, then go work for a religious organization that is allowed to discriminate for some reason. I hope they're going to say no. They probably will say no, but also, like, most jobs, you will know beforehand if there are going to be things that bother you about it morally. So don't apply for the jobs that you think are immoral. If an LGBTQ rights organization hired you to give a talk, even if the talk has nothing to do with anything LGBTQ related, you are free to turn them down. Them trying to hire you and you having advanced knowledge of who they are and what they stand for is not them expecting you to violate your conscience. They don't get to decide what's in your conscience. That's a decision you have to make when the job offer is there. And I'd imagine you'd say no, because you're a bigot. Now, it's, it's because nobody asked these questions that these policies just continue. No, it's really not, though. These questions have been thoroughly asked and answered many times over. It's because companies have found Jedi practices to be more profitable that these policies continue. That's capitalism, Frank. You claim to like it. 
And a lot of times, I think people in HR and even from the CEO on down, they're just towing the party line. They just want to get that 100 score from the human rights campaign. They don't want anybody suggesting they're not an inclusive place to work. I mean, you seem to be operating under the impression that a 100 score from the human rights campaign is the only thing that a CEO is concerned about. And yeah, getting their Equality 100 award would be pretty good for the company, but that is far from the only thing there is to having a good corporate image. Like, Goldman Sachs has received that award, but I don't know of anyone who has a favorable opinion of them. Cisco does not appear to have gotten it, so I guess firing you, or rather not recontracting you, didn't quite get them over that bar. But more important than some award that I actually hadn't even heard of until Frank just said it, is what I mentioned earlier. Companies that are more practiced in the Jedi ways do better financially. This is just an objective fact of reality. So greedy CEOs have financial motivation to make their companies more Jedi friendly. When in reality, inclusion doesn't mean that anybody can work here. It means only people that agree with these certain sexual behaviors and practices and political beliefs can work here. No, absolutely not. You do not have to agree with that stuff to work there. You are free to be a bigot. You're even usually free to make that bigotry public knowledge. Generally speaking, a company can't fire you for posting something they don't like on social media. Well, I mean, in Canada anyway. At-will employment is still a wild concept to me. Like, when you lose a job in Canada, they legally have to issue you a record of employment detailing your first and last days worked, and how much money you made there, and one of the fields in the form is the reason given for leaving the company. That's where they have to say if they fired you and why. And if you got fired for cause, that makes collecting unemployment benefits harder. I actually once had an employer try to do that to me because he was refusing to issue my ROE and ignoring my emails asking for it. So eventually I emailed him a link to the website that says that if employers do not issue the ROE in a timely fashion, they can be subject to a $2,000 fine and up to a year in prison for the person responsible. He then emailed me back saying that he had changed my reason from laid off to quit, which makes it much harder to collect benefits as you now have to prove that you aren't just quitting to get some easy money out of the social safety net. Thankfully, he explicitly stated that that's what he was doing in the email, so I just had to show them that email and everything went through no problem. Anyway, generally speaking, you can't be fired for your private beliefs as long as they don't impact your job performance. It's when your bigotry starts affecting your job and those that you are working with that it might put your job in jeopardy. So as long as you keep it to yourself, at least in the workplace, you should be fine. You know, I actually used to be a similar bigot. I thought gay marriage was an abomination. But I also worked in restaurants. Do you know who you find a lot of working in restaurants? LGBTQ people. They are all over the place. And I treated them the same as I treated everyone else despite my bigoted views. I didn't comment on the morality of gay marriage at work, I just avoided the subject entirely. But if I had started telling the gay pastry chef that I didn't approve of his relationship with his boyfriend, then I likely would have been reprimanded and eventually fired if I didn't stop that behavior. But just treating him as a normal human being allowed me to work there for years, all without having to compromise on my bigoted views. And honestly? Knowing him as a person without being in a place where it was appropriate for me to provide my shitty opinion about his sexuality allowed me to see him as a human rather than as a sexuality. I got to know him. We both had concerns about bills. We both loved the desserts that featured panna cotta. We both complained about our stupid junky cars. He was just another person, same as me. We were never close enough that we ever hung out outside of work, but working with him made it easier for me to make the transition from bigoted Christian asshole to atheist who doesn't care what people do in the bedroom as long as everybody is an enthusiastically consenting adult. Unless you hide it from everybody. Well, to quote you earlier in this very podcast, Why do we need to even be talking about sex at work? So according to you, this is not something that should even be discussed at work. So yeah, you keep your bigotry hidden while on the job. You might also ask, if you want to get specific, if they're really promoting transgenderism, you might say, why does the company think it has the medical expertise to order employees to encourage people to stay in their state of gender dysphoria? Again, that question shows that you have a fundamental misunderstanding of the issue. The company does not have the medical expertise to make that decision, and neither do you. Do you know who does? The doctors that trans people are going to see who prescribe them things like hormone treatments, the therapists and psychologists who take care of their mental health, and yes, even the surgeons who perform gender-affirming surgeries. 
All of the evidence we have so far points to being trans as a real thing that happens to some people, and providing these people with gender-affirming care leads to better outcomes across the board. The first link in the sources section of my description is to a Linktree page where I've been collecting papers documenting the benefits of providing gender-affirming care. It's far from exhaustive, but there is a lot on there, and it all comes to the conclusion that gender-affirming care is the appropriate course of action for trans people. Now, are there reasons someone can experience gender dysphoria without actually being trans? Yes, there are. And that's one of the reasons why, before any permanent treatments happen, there's usually a requirement of several years of therapy as well as a documented history of consistent gender expression. That's also why permanent treatments are almost never given to minors. The very few minors who do receive more permanent treatments have to have demonstrated years of consistency in their gender expression and robust mental health, and in most cases, the only permanent treatment available to such minors is mastectomy. Despite what you are inevitably going to see in the comment section of this video, nobody is running around chopping off kids' dicks as soon as they show any interest in transitioning. That is 100% a straw man. In fact, there are so many barriers to getting permanent care because there is such a public perception that being trans is a fad or a phase that will wear off, that it actually makes life significantly harder for trans people, all in the name of the noble cis people protecting them from themselves. Gender-affirming surgery has one of the lowest regret rates of any surgery there is, and that includes life-saving surgeries like mastectomies for breast cancer or quality-of-life-improving surgeries like knee surgery. Cosmetic surgery has an abysmal regret rate, with 65% of people regretting it. Gender-affirming surgeries have consistently had regret rates less than 5%, with the most robust data tending to show lower regret rates of usually less than 1%. But people who aren't even affected by gender-affirming surgeries cry out about how risky it is! We don't want people to undergo a surgery that will permanently alter their body, they might regret it later! Oh, hey, and while we're at it, let's go ahead and circumcise this baby boy who has no way of consenting to the permanent alteration of his genitals. Like, if you're going to be at all consistent, you should be opposing cosmetic surgeries way more vocally than any trans treatment. Also, it's worth mentioning that the biggest reason for regret among the very few people who regret gender-affirming surgery is social reasons. Assholes like Frank won't stop misgendering them and deadnaming them, all in the name of supposed truth. Family members will opine on how they wish they could have just been happy the way they were. If you don't easily pass even after the surgery, companies will be less likely to hire them. People in public will stare and make fun of them. It's not a problem with the surgery that causes them to regret getting it. It's assholes like Frank who insist on making their lives miserable. So. If assholes like Frank would just mind their own fucking business instead of pretending that they are actually more qualified than medical professionals to make medical decisions for trans people that they don't even know, then even fewer trans people would regret receiving gender-affirming care. I mean, are we doctors here? No, you're not. So maybe stop pontificating about medical treatments that don't even have anything to do with you. You could also ask... Is the company aware that those with gender dysphoria have a suicide rate 19 times higher than the general public after surgery? And did you know that blatantly misrepresenting data is the equivalent of lying? I thought you said that lying was against your conscience and then used that as justification for misgendering people. So before I get into that actual claim, it bears mentioning that even if that claim as stated were 100% accurate and was not missing vital context, that is not relevant to a corporation. What do you think corporations should do with this information? Refuse to hire people that belong to groups that have a higher rate of suicide? Allow assholes like you to make life miserable for people who do have a higher rate of suicide with zero repercussions? The risk of someone with major depression dying by suicide is also 20 times higher than the general population. What should corporations do with that information? Nothing, that's what. Leave it between them and their healthcare providers, and treat them with dignity, respect, and understanding on the job, making accommodations when necessary. But hey, now that we've established that this information is completely irrelevant to anything to do with the company's Jedi policies, let's actually look into it. So first, the study that found that was comparing post-op trans people to the general population, not to pre-op trans people. So from that study, we cannot conclude that surgery increases the risk of suicide, as it never established a pre-op suicide risk for trans people. Second, the study looked at post-op trans people who received their operation between 1973 and 2003. And in the study itself, they say, the overall mortality rate was only significantly increased for the group operated before 1989. However, the latter 
Twitter might also be explained by improved healthcare for transsexual persons during the 1990s, along with altered societal attitudes towards persons with different gender expressions. In other words, the increased risk of suicide was mostly in people who received the surgery before 1989, and as surgical techniques improved and societal attitudes became more accepting, the suicide rate went down. On that note, third, the increase in mental health problems and suicidality among trans people can almost entirely be attributed to minority stress, the phenomenon where someone who is part of a marginalized community has extra stress in their lives as a result of their being a part of that community, and this leads to all kinds of bad health outcomes. Experiencing discrimination significantly increases the likelihood of trans individuals having suicidal ideation, so if there is an increased chance of a trans person dying by suicide, it is specifically because of people like Frank being bigoted assholes. If Frank actually cared about lowering suicide rates, he would, you know, stop being a bigoted asshole. Fourth, research has consistently shown that trans people who receive gender-affirming care, including surgeries, have significantly better mental health outcomes than those who do not, which is something that the study Frank just referenced doesn't even attempt to address. So yeah, one study found a significantly higher suicide rate in a very specific subset of the trans population, which is something that shouldn't matter when it comes to corporate policies on treating people like human beings. But also, what Frank is advocating for is likely the very thing that made that suicide rate so high in the first place. Have I mentioned that he's an asshole? Why would we encourage people to go down that road? Because that road is much less dark than the one that you're proposing. At least, when you actually look at all of the data instead of just one single cherry-picked statistic out of one single study. It's also worth mentioning that the study was only looking at people in Sweden, so there's likely cultural factors to consider that might impact the number as well. Honestly though, it wouldn't surprise me if it was actually worse for trans people in that same time period of American history, but I don't think that study exists. And why are we talking about sex in the workplace? What does it have to do with workplace productivity? You keep coming back to that, but nobody is talking about sex except for you. Unless you've now gone from talking about sex the verb to sex the noun, in which case making sure a workplace does not discriminate based on sex, even if it didn't have a demonstrably positive effect on revenue, would still be something worth doing, because everyone deserves the same opportunity regardless of sex. Why is the company seemingly forcing people to take firm positions on controversial political and moral issues. What company is doing that? I mean, I can think of at least a dozen Christian-run companies and organizations that do that. Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, The Ark Encounter, Liberty University, Brigham Young University, just to name a few. But secular companies get into hot water if they try any of that sort of thing. Like I have already repeatedly said, you are not required to endorse anything. You're just not allowed to treat people differently based on your bigotry. Look, sir, ma'am, I treat everyone with respect regardless of any political or moral disagreements we may have. I do not want to try and force people to act in ways contrary to their conscience. Yeah, I'm gonna call bullshit on that. You post on Twitter regularly about how it's against your religion to use a trans person's correct pronouns. With anyone else, you just use their correct pronouns without a fuss, but as soon as it's a trans person, no way. I have to refer to trans men exclusively as though they were women, based on nothing but the fact that I don't like trans people. And you try to justify it by appealing to your conscience requiring you to always speak the truth. And you think it's true that the pronoun you decided based on nothing but appearances was the correct one. Except you've already demonstrated in this very podcast that you don't find it necessary to tell the truth, at least when it comes to the data surrounding healthcare for trans people. You can just plunk down one single highly cherry-picked statistic and act as though it's true for all trans people everywhere, when it only applies to trans people who had surgery 35 years ago or more in Sweden. If you actually cared about telling the truth, you wouldn't be an anti-LGBTQ bigot. And I only ask the same respect in return. And trans people, by and large, give you that respect. Very rarely have I ever seen any trans person misgender someone on purpose in order to make a point about how painful it can be to misgender someone. Because, you know, trans people actually understand how hurtful that can be. I once made a video where I referred to God as she throughout the entire video, for the purpose of not just pointing out that God does not even have the features that people like Frank insist are integral to gender, like a penis or chromosomes or whatever, but also just for it to be annoying to people who think of God as he so that they can get a taste of what the annoyance is like. And the backlash that I got from that 
was not from transphobes. Well, mostly I got some of that, but most of the backlash was from trans people letting me know, very respectfully I might add, that they understand that my doing that came from a place of good intentions, but they'd prefer if I showed the same respect to others that they expect from others. Now, obviously, trans people is not a monolithic category. There will be a variety of opinions on stuff like this, but in my experience, for the most part, trans people would never treat Frank with the level of disrespect that he constantly advocates that they be treated with. Do you consider yourself a tolerant person? Because if they say yes, you can say great, because if I offer opinion, an opinion that's different than yours, you'll tolerate it then, right? Wow, 12 minutes in. I'm surprised you took this long to get to the whole you're intolerant of my intolerance thing. And well, yes, it's a fun little soundbite that sounds like it makes sense. When you think about it for just one single second, you realize that it's possible for tolerance to be intolerant of intolerance because absolutes don't work in the real world. Like, Frank would probably agree that the United States is a free country, but in the US, I am not free to rob a bank. I'll go to jail if I try that, so clearly it's not free. Well, yeah, there are some limitations on that freedom, because in order for a country to maximize the freedom of its citizens, it has to restrict their freedoms to a certain degree. Same thing with tolerance. In order to maximize tolerance, people who are not willing to be tolerant of others cannot be tolerated. If a company in the name of tolerance allows intolerant people to exist at all levels in the company, then that company will become de facto intolerant, even if its policies state otherwise. So in order to remain tolerant in actuality, the intolerant people cannot be allowed to impact policy decisions. And what's more, in practice, your intolerance will be tolerated as long as you can keep it to yourself in the workplace. But as soon as you start making trouble, for instance by misgendering a trans coworker or customer, that's when it'll become a problem related to job performance. Look, asking questions is easy. Answering questions is hard. Yeah, but it's made even harder when the questioner is a dishonest little shit who's asking questions with the goal of driving the conversation to his desired outcome, rather than out of an honest desire to learn the answer. And that's why this video that I thought was going to be a quick answer these 10 questions video is so much longer than I thought it would be when I first saw the title of the podcast. I noticed about five pages into my script that there's a plus sign beside the number 10. So they just titled it as though it were a listicle for the clicks. Well, you know what? They got me. It's too late to turn back now. We still have eight minutes of the podcast to cover. So you might take a hit for even asking these questions. They may throw you out of there. You might lose your job which goes to show you they're not really for inclusion, tolerance, justice, and diversity, are they? So there you have it. Frank Turek wants you to lose your job in order to make a point. And it's not even a good point to make. If you ask these questions in a calm way and seeking to understand, and you still get fired, then you might have a claim with the Alliance Defending Freedom. If you ask the questions that Frank is suggesting and in the tone that he is presenting them with, then you aren't looking for answers. You're looking for them to be unable to answer so that you can go, aha, you don't have an answer. Is having a few seconds of empty vindication for winning a word game that falls apart as soon as you think about it really worth losing your livelihood over? You can't say it's about truth. Frank has already demonstrated that he's willing to lie. Personally, I'd rather have a job than have a momentary feeling of owning the libs by asking stupid questions. The Alliance Defending Freedom, for those of you that don't know, is a great group of Christian attorneys. They're out of Phoenix, Arizona, and they often help Christians and even non-Christians. Um, well, I, I assume they help some non-Christians that have religious liberty claims. Frank, buddy, you could have just edited that out of your podcast. If they were actually worried about religious liberty... That would have been a valid assumption, but they are explicitly Christian and don't care about the other religions, they just want the Christians to have extra rights. The only mention I can find of them taking up a case that had anything to do with any non-Christian religion was the time they defended a Christian adoption agency that refused to let Jewish parents adopt. If they were willing to help non-Christians, the clear people to help in that instance would have been the Jewish parents, not the anti-Semitic adoption agency. Also, remember back when he asked why a company is seemingly forcing people to take a firm position on controversial political and moral issues? Well, just try and get a job at the ADF as a lawyer who believes that abortion is a religious right for Jewish people. Or do you think the ADF would hire a gay person? 
I mean, I doubt anyone would want to work there, but that's not the point. They are overtly discriminatory in their hiring practices. They only hire Christians. That much is made clear on their website, where on the careers page it lists Christ-centered as one of their guiding principles. Earlier, Frank seemed to be against companies insisting that everyone have the same view on everything, including religion, but now he's promoting one of the worst offenders that there is on that matter? It really is amazingly hypocritical, even for Frank. Now, undoubtedly, the defense for this would be something along the lines of, well, you know it's a Christian company, so if you're not a Christian, just don't apply. But if you'll recall, that was pretty much my stance on the whole thing. A plethora of companies exist that are explicitly geared towards bigoted Christians, so if such a Christian feels it's against their morality to work for a secular company that might at least try to treat LGBTQ people equally, they can go work for one of these other companies. But it's better to catch some trouble than to live by lies. Okay then, Frank, put your money where your mouth is. Stop lying about the data about trans people, and then watch as your core audience abandons you for no longer holding the exact same views as them. Throughout this whole thing, he's been pretending like this is purely a secular problem. It's only secular corporations that demand their employees all believe the same things. But if Turek came out tomorrow and said, I was actually wrong about trans people. Turns out the data says that they are real and valid, and we'll do much better if we treat them better and stop pontificating about how letting them receive medical care is somehow going to cause the fall of Western civilization. Then you can bet your ass he would be kicked to the curb immediately. Apologists everywhere would denounce him and make videos about how sad they are that Turek went woke. He is a giant hypocrite as he sits there accusing the nebulous concept of woke corporations of requiring adherence to a specific set of beliefs and principles when it couldn't possibly be more obvious that he would, and does, require adherence to a specific set of beliefs and principles in order to work for his organization. Do you think he would ever hire a Muslim, an LGBTQ person, someone who is vocal on social media about being pro-choice? No, obviously not. So why does he rail against his perception of companies doing the same thing that his company does? And that's it for this one. He spends the rest of the episode encouraging Christians to form small groups who will pledge to financially support each other if they lose their jobs for being bigots. Which, given the state of the scam that is the Christian medical cost-sharing ministries thing, I very much doubt would be helpful. If anything, it would just open the door for a Christian unemployment benefits scam, where they take payments in exchange for the promise of financial support if you lose your job doing what Frank is suggesting. And of course, you have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is exactly why you lost your job before they'll pay out, but they won't make that clear, so they'll just effectively be taking your money and running. I hope for their sake that nothing like this ever happens, but if people take Frank's suggestion seriously, I can definitely see some unscrupulous people taking advantage of it. Thanks for watching. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Cthulpiss, who says, What camera and lens combo do you use, if I may ask? You may. My camera is the pretty standard among YouTubers, Canon M50 Mark II, and the lens is the total fucking overkill for what I do, Sigma 18-35mm f1.8 DC HSM. I threw it on my Amazon wish list as a bit of a lark, not thinking that anyone would actually buy the damn thing. The ultimate intention there was for me to remember that that's the lens that I wanted to when I eventually had the budget for it. But then a saint descended, and one day it arrived without fanfare, just sitting on my front porch. Unfortunately, Amazon doesn't digitally tell you who bought it for you, and I lost the little piece of paper with their name on it, so their name will forever be lost in the dusty desert that is my ADHD brain. But when I opened that unexpected package that showed up on my porch, I squealed the highest pitched squeal you ever did hear. I really wish it was on video so I could show my generous benefactor just how excited I was. Thanks for watching. Apparently I'm saying that twice today. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30pm Eastern, and with my partner every Thursday at 2pm Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the questioners who just want to know the answers that are my channel. If you'd like to jack off, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!